So to everyone who's watching, thank you very much. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us. So I hope everyone is having a great Tuesday afternoon and keeping safe and healthy wherever you are. Yeah. For the next hour, I'll be sharing how workplace learning can play a pivotal role in overcoming the challenges we see ahead for business and for all individuals, all of us. The key focus of my session will be to describe, explore, and share the benefits of workplace learning in this era of uh, disruption and change, really. So before I begin, just a little bit about myself. I have over 20 years of uh, experience in learning and development. I was a pioneer in the development of competency-based training programs starting in 2007 when I first started to develop for WSQ programs under the uh, old uh, Skills Future, which was WDA. I have a Master of Arts in Education. I have DAYS, ACTA, and the like. Now, I joined NACE, the National Center of Excellence for Workplace Learning in February 2019. And the reason is that I'm really excited about helping companies to sustain this workplace learning culture. I've been a facilitator and trainer as well. So I have a lot of uh, vested uh, emotion and uh, uh, interest in this area because I've seen a lot of training happen and sometimes the, the training that does not lead to performance that leads us as facilitators to feel like we wish we could do more to help our employees and our Singaporeans and our workforce put in place the learning that they learned at the classroom. So I'm excited. I was excited to join NACE because this is precisely what we're trying to do. In my current role, I assist companies implement these workplace learning strategies and I actually pioneered a trip to Germany last year. We took uh, a bunch of people to Germany, uh, business leaders, to learn more about how to implement workplace learning better, especially from our uh, experts uh, that are our partners from uh, Germany. Yeah, so currently I'm also co-leading a committee developing a national workplace learning framework, which I'll share a little bit more with you after uh, our coverage of what is workplace learning, really. So NACE. The National Centre of Excellence for Workplace Learning was inaugurated in July 2018 by Minister Ong Yi Kang with a key mandate to help companies level up their learning and training capability. Led by Nanyang Polytechnic, we're a strategic collaboration between SkillsFuture Singapore and Nanyang Polytechnic. So our partners that I spoke about are the Swiss Federal Institute for Vocational Education and Training, the German Chamber of Industry and Commerce, and the Singaporean German Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Now, why do we choose these European partners? Because they are the experts in workplace learning. They have 500 years of apprenticeships. They are a high uh, wage economy. And even though with COVID and uh, we're all struggling through, they're still managing to do um, relatively well in terms of their economy. So we hope that we can learn from them. And um, NACE was set up with them as partners to help us learn on what are the best practices for workplace learning and help localize it for the Singapore marketplace. <clears throat> so the focus areas I have here are first, we want to understand the drive towards workplace learning, how to implement workplace learn, a holistic approach to workplace learning at the organizational level. We want to understand how to build capabilities. Sorry. Yes. We want to understand how to build capabilities for workplace learning at the individual level. And then we want to talk about some ideas about the benefits of implementing workplace learning. To start off, I wonder if we can do something. Let's do a bit of sharing on learning, if you don't mind. You can scan the QR code and go to www mentimeter.com and let's take about a minute to put in some entries. The question I have here is, what are some skills and knowledge you recently learned? Okay, you, you recently learned at the workplace, acquired or improved on while working. Now I know a lot of us have been working from home, but think back perhaps um, last year even, what did you learn when you were doing work, when you were in the midst of work? There were skills or competencies that you built up. So what were some of those? Maybe we take a minute to take, to take a look. And I'll go to Mentimeter and look at the results. Okay. 
I hope you can see these are just some of the skills that we were learning at the workplace. We learned leadership skills, remote working, understanding TSCs, digitalization, virtual presentation. Yes, certainly that's what I'm doing too. And we learned resilience, automation, digital learning, some wonderful, wonderful skills. And I'm going to stop share and go back to my presentation. Okay. Uh, right. <clears throat> so, we want to talk about workplace learning, which is what some of these skills that you picked up were from the workplace. What do we mean by workplace learning? It's the acquisition of knowledge or skills by formal or informal means that occurs in the workplace rather than knowledge or skills that is outside of the workplace, for example, that we learn from the classrooms. So it includes both formal on-the-job training and informal channels of learning. So this is a definition that was given to us by or introduced to us by the International Labour Organization. There are other definitions as well. So uh, world-renowned workplace learning expert Professor Stephen Billard argued that we should be very intentional about workplace learning. That means we should make plans and actually implement operationally um, practices and policies for workplace learning in order to make the most of the affordances for learning at work. So what I've seen is that the, the skills that you, you have shared with us, we have all shared and seen together, some of them we might have picked up through formal learning at the workplace and some could be from informal learning at the workplace. So it's interesting how much we ourselves learn and how it can be formal as well as informal. So for example, virtual presentation could be something that we picked up as we uh, learned by watching people um, through Zoom training. Well, I certainly did, that's for sure, yeah? So this, this is the drive towards workplace learning because we find that there are so many skills and competencies that we can build up from doing the work itself. More and more research on learning and development are concluding that people are building up competencies they need to do at their workplace and from job experience itself or from on-the-job training rather than just classroom training. If OJT is structured, this type of learning can usually be highly contextualized to fit the needs of the people and the organization. So as an organization goes through changes and um, they need to adapt quickly, then the workplace itself, because if they're structured OJT, we can make changes and we can quickly roll this down to our people. A study by Michael M. Lombardo and Robert, Robert W. Einhinger proposed a 70-20-10 model for learning. In fact, they contend that we need to learn 70% of what we need on the job itself and 20% from coaching and about 10% from the classroom. The workplace itself is then a significant source of learning and workplace learning has emerged as this powerful learning model that companies need to embrace to meet the business challenges. Yeah. So what were some of these challenges prior to COVID-19 that were reported, that, we've, uh, that was talked about and discussed and thought, thought about in terms of uh, whether workplace learning could address it, right? So one challenge was best practices for key work processes were not clearly set. So that's where on-the-job training and um, activities like that could help. Gaps in knowledge, skills, and attitude for the tasks to be done were not spelt out. We found that there were communication challenges arising from different nationalities working together. There was a lack of coaching skills that was reported by companies um, that is needed to help employees be guided well. Turnover rate can sometimes be high, leading to a loss of critical organizational knowledge. Another challenge was sometimes um, innovative problem solving was not always shared, so there's not enough platforms for peer learning. And there was a lack of intentional efforts to identify talent management for succession planning. And more importantly, uh, what was found is that most, 
employers felt that it could help if more and more of their people had a learning mindset. That means they were themselves invested in learning and interested in bettering their performance through a learning intervention. Yeah. Then this was prior to COVID, we collected all this data and we, and we found these are the challenges companies presented, shared with us, and that we thought workplace learning could address. Then came COVID. So with COVID, there came a new set of challenges and there was disruption and change, right? We all know this. There was a need to quickly adapt, transform to the new norm by upskilling and retraining. There was a need to support our people through the change. There was a need to curate the correct kind of learning that supports this quick change. There was a need to promote flexibility, adaptability, flexibility working from home, adaptability doing things differently because we were meant to be at work to do it. Empowerment, because sometimes um, you can't always um, be connected to your peers and you need to, to make decisions based on uh, current um, problems that crop up because of the change, yeah? And with, with this disruption, there is a need for us em employees as well as business owners to strengthen knowledge management because a lot of employees, a lot of our colleagues who for whatever reason may need to leave means that there is a loss of toxic knowledge or organizational best practices. I mean, COVID has brought a lot of change. It's not just about uh, losing employees because of retrenchments, which fortunately has not happened um, that much. But sometimes because of work from home, some people are just needing to be not at the work front and needing to take care of their children or um, uh, home-based learning. So there's a lot of loss of employee time and there is a need to strengthen knowledge management. So these are some of the challenges that COVID-19 brought on. We see around us and from the news that capability development has been signaled as key to managing some of these disruptions, right? As individuals, we're being asked to look into learning new things. Um, employers are being asked to retrain, employ, um, re retrain workers early for future jobs. We see the, the headlines. There may not be that much time to invest in learning in the classroom for such purposes. We can't just wait for an employee to, to go through a training program and then learn everything they need in order to perform at work. So employees may need to learn more and more on the job itself as they switch roles. And it would be good for employers to level up the managers and supervisors to coach and to mentor and to train their team members well. Then we also find employees themselves are changing and adapting. We read the news that many employees want to continue to work from home for some time. So what does this mean? There's a challenge for companies, right? The need for new models of work and business processes to run their operations. There's a need to do job redesign, to alter, reform, reconfigure, and redefine job roles to suit the new work needs. The challenge for us employees is the need to gain these new skills in quick time right, and adapt. So there's this need to reskill and there's this need to upskill, which is dovetails with what, with what uh, the government is trying to support us to do and Skills Future is partnering with industry to do. Yeah. We, we now know that there is no such thing as a job for life. This book came out a long time ago and um, basically um, this is called The Hundred your life right by Linda Gutman and it's best book, business book of the year and they say that the flexible nature of the modern workforce will likely see a 15 year old today navigating a portfolio of 17 jobs in five different industries so this was prior to COVID we already expected a lot of change and now with COVID is even more so so change is a mainstay for us and we need to be open to develop new skills and take on these new roles yeah so we know that uh, we're all learning for this VUCA world. To deal with an increasingly VUCA world, we need to learn and adapt. Failing to pay attention to continuous learning and capability development has a cost to both the organization and the individual, right? When learning stops, company has lower productivity, potential talent leakage and erosion of knowledge. For the employee, it's an, ability, it's an inability to contribute to the changes and uh, having a fixed mindset because we're not challenged to improve. We might have obsolete skill sets and we might end up stagnant, right? So hence, these are the motivations and reasons behind the drive uh, to continue learning and especially with workplace learning. So moving forward, 
how do we build a workplace learning culture that can help employees adapt, reskill, upskill, and deal with change and disruption quickly? How do we support our employees to learn at work? The 2020 Workplace Learning Report from LinkedIn has some recommendations. Onboarding is one key solutioning that we can have to help people learn quickly when they take on a new role. So we can make learning a priority from day one. So having a proper onboarding structured learning process would be great. Executive sponsorship. Are we able to set up systems and processes where executives can be learning champions and learning managers, right? Managers can also be activated to help personalize learning, to coach and to mentor according to the needs of the coachee or the team members. Um, new managers can have new skills in terms of coaching and mentoring. That would help push forward workplace learning. Of course, through performance reviews, we can have um, people at the center of the performance reviews ask them what they themselves feel like they would need to learn best, right? And make the case to the learners, get the buy-in from the employees that they want to rigorously take note of what they are learning and what are the skills gaps that they have and what they can do at the workplace itself to learn better, to be coached, to improve and to build new skills. Yeah. So besides the question on what we recently learned at work prior to COVID-19, um, I'd like to do our first poll, which is uh, a question about um, the ways in which we are engaged in workplace learning. So can you answer the question, have you or your team members engaged in any of these activities? You can think about it perhaps prior to COVID as well, because we hope that COVID will, will kind of um, leave us pretty soon and we can go back to our, our, our lives where we can learn at the workplace itself. So what are some ways in which we, we are learning? Oh, okay. So I see that uh, you have trained others, you've been part of a COP, mentors, wonderful, learning from meetings, yes. And uh, job shadowing, even job rotation, be a buddy to a new employee. So those are definitely intentional ways uh, that companies have set up practices to help people learn from each other and learn at work, which are wonderful. Yes. So I think that's great news to hear that most of these tools are being used in the companies itself. Thank you very much for playing. I'm very glad to hear that. <clears throat> okay, I think I'll stop the results. Right. So we see that there were these intentional efforts already present. So building a workplace learning friendly organization requires these types of intentional efforts. Okay, and as we remind ourselves, Stephen Billard uh, has said, we should be intentional about workplace learning. Now, these are some of the practices, but in order for us to build a more holistic approach to workplace learning, we do have to consider a systemic uh, set up, right? Is it a systems issue? We have to set up a, a workplace learning system that can support all these practices, policies, and activities. And that will require engagement and strategy, the right strategy for workplace learning, uh, leadership support, uh, planning activities, uh, training needs analysis to see what are the uh, core gaps in our company and what can we do to bridge those skills gaps creating a conducive environment for learning as well as having the proper implementation and processes yeah so i'll just talk about this holistic approach when we talk about strategy we're talking about the need to take stock of our current organizational competencies what actions can we take for competency development for the current and for the future business goals do we have the skills that we require to get to the desired state? So, for example, a lot of companies uh, reach for digitalization. Have we looked at whether we have skilled up our people for digitalization? Right? So we need to see what are the skills gap at the strategy level that we need to work towards to build these skills and competencies in our people in order to, to learn the right things and to be able to perform for that desired state. 
right? Then we need to promote the, the benefits of workplace learning. So the strategy has to be to, to champion learning in the company. Right. As leaders, what can we do? Leaders, we can role model. We can be ourselves learning champions. We can share what we learn ourselves. We can share that this is our roadmap for our own learning journey. So that will build uh, that, that culture of learning around team members uh, that you manage. Right? Develop and empower the leaders uh, to be coaches and mentors. So for the rest of us, maybe we're not people managers. We can ourselves um, build up skills in, in coaching and mentoring because there is such a thing as peer coaching and peer mentoring. So as long as we, we are able to know how to be at a best practice in our role, we can share that with other people and that actually um, helps uh, a learning culture develop. Yeah? Enact policies to develop the employee, employees, provide platforms and channels for peer learning. Under planning, of course, um, at the organization, organizational level, we should plan learning programs and schedules effectively. A lot of times, right, people say, I don't have time for training. Well, if we did a proper plan for training, then we would know, and it fits the line or the operations or the business processes. It has to fit their timing as well. We have to schedule it. We have to make it a priority as well. We can plan for induction programs. It's very important uh, for the apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs in, in Europe. They're very, very proper in terms of their induction programs. And it helps because if you begin day one doing, uh, knowing how to do the right things and actually doing your job well and being, being uh, coached, mentored and buddied by people who know how to guide and teach, that's very, very powerful, right? Select appropriate trainers and coaches, provide adequate support and resources for workplace learning. That's important. Then for training needs analysis, we need to do the, the TNA uh, at the department level, even a skills gap at the individual level will be helpful so that we know what is, uh, what are the ways in which we can plug those gaps, right? Developing a company training plan would help, right? We need to s find an environment suitable for learning. So when we talk about flexibility in learning, we're not just talking about, um, uh, you know, the methods for learning. We can also talk about um, the profile of the employee. Sometimes an older worker may, may not be so digitally, uh, uh, you know, um, com uh, I wouldn't say competent, but comfortable, right? So are there other platforms for someone who's not digitally comfortable to learn? If the learning format is e-learning, is, is there another way they can build that competency? Or if it could be someone who's um, uh, a young adult and they prefer to have a different format for learning. So flexibility to pick up competencies and build capabilities. Is, are there ways in which the company can support that? Create a conducive environment for learning, professional development opportunities. Those are also under the, the umbrella of creating a, a good environment for learning in a company. And of course, um, when we look at implementation and processes, we're talking about what are the modes of learning, the methods of learning, the, the learning pathways, you know, what can we do to, to help people um, learn best given their preference, given their profiling. Yeah. So that's from building a holistic uh, approach to a, a workplace learning culture, right? But when we look at ourselves, what can we do to build capabilities for workplace learning? So at the organizational level, we can build a holistic approach, but at the individual level, can we all build capabilities for workplace learning? So here are some of the capabilities that would help us would be uh, having skills in on-the-job training, uh, do you, are you able to do an, a blueprint of your own role? Do you, do you actually look at your job description and actually ab, uh, you're able to translate that into a blueprint of best practices? How best you can do that role? Do we have those skills? Then, then this could be useful for if we have a new buddy join us to do the same role. So it can make, for example, onboarding very, very um, uh, effective because then we already have um, mapped out the best practices of our own role or um, when we take on a new role that blueprint is there for us so that we were able to adapt uh, to change and disruption quite quickly and take on these roles. Yeah? Managers can actually build up coaching and mentoring skills. So with mentoring and coaching, you can personalize learning, you can actually um, enhance the capacity of talent to move forward. And training needs analysis, obviously, we can cl close those gaps and, and understand what are the right um, skills to be building once we know what the exact gaps are. Yeah? 
So on the job training describes this process of skilling up employees to complete the activities. So we can, we can actually read up more if you're interested in what uh, on the job training is about. But uh, companies like Google have actually uh, implemented such things and uh, manufacturing companies have always done it, healthcare. But you know, now we find that more and more companies have found the value of actually mapping work, mapping best practices, codifying best practices for their own knowledge management and for the sharing uh, amongst people is yeah so benefits of on the job training is an intentional structured approach um, it codifies best practices as, as I mentioned um, it actually identifies the knowledge skills and attitudes needed for the job task so actual competencies have to be identified job redesign efforts would actually benefit greatly from having these um, blueprints training can be conducted at the workplace making the learning experience very workplace relevant perhaps even saving time because now we don't have to go to the classroom but we can we can actually learn for what we need for the workplace not not to have a lot of wastage in learning when we go to the classroom and only 50 percent is actually suitable for the workplace so with what with on the job training it's very absolutely relevant because it's workplace relevant yeah so it provides learners with clarity on job tasks specific job tasks and then of course um, it can be conducted by qualified coaches trainers and supervisors so um some example of a, a very simple example of an OJT blueprint can be these. So when you have your main task, your task elements, key points of a, of a particular role, the test standards that are set, what are the knowledge and skills? And if you're having to train or coach someone, is it possible to actually uh, put, put in place some, some helpful guidelines on how to coach and train them? Yeah? So some companies that have implemented OJT include Gardenia, yeah, Gardenia developed OJT blueprints for their production uh, coordinators. They codified the key tasks and competencies and they found great benefits to doing that. Another company that we have worked with is um, Novatel. So they found that um, it helped when they were doing a job redesign. They, they, used, um, they redesigned the work process and they created a blueprint so that that knowledge of how things should be done now is cascaded quite quickly and it's, it, there's a piece of work that's very clear this is how we want to do it when we've redesigned it so this creates transparency and inclusiveness for the staff yeah now what about coaching coaching we know we it's been around for a long time it's basically about guiding people to close gaps and it's particularly useful when we're looking at reskilling and upskilling in um, time effective ways if we have the right skills as a line manager to coach and uh, quick you know to, to coach effectively then when we need to reskill and upskill we would have the requisite um, ability to to do that <clears throat> so I'd like to conduct my <laughs> second poll now because as I mentioned coaching has been with us for a long time so I'd like to see and understand from your perspective why does coaching fail sometimes and what does it look like when coaching actually fails <laughs> in your own experiences, in your own organizations. Why does coaching fail sometimes? Do I have any more? Organizational culture is not conducive, seems to be quite, quite high on the list. Unclear deferring goals. Okay. Right, so you can see that the, the results um, seem to say a few things, right? Organizational culture is not conducive, and it seems to be the highest. And uh, that's, yeah, representation of all of these reasons. So that's not surprising because a lot of the research actually does uh, also paint that uh, to be the case. Although coaching is valuable, uh, it's important, but somehow uh, organizations may not... Um, be conducive for uh, they, they don't train up their people or it's not really conducive right so when when we look at what makes a good coach right coaching can fail sometimes because we don't have uh the conducive culture or the training and um as an organ as with 
our organizations, right? Do we find that these things are happening? Do we identify the skills for coaching we need to see in all of our people managers? Do our people managers have them? Do we set criteria and standards for effective coaching? Do we have a qualification process to recognize coaches and mentors in the organization? Do we actually have a selection process for coaches and mentors? And then finally, um, do we reward? Do we recognize good coaches in our organizations? Now, our partners, the Germans and the Swiss, they actually do have these activities. They actually do have a qualification process. You know, you can't just, um, it's seen as uh, something of a, uh, of a good thing, you know, uh, if you're, you're someone that can coach well or you're a mentor, there's a certain respect accorded to a person that is able to do that. So in, in Singapore, if, with, with the work of the National uh, Centre for Excellence in Workplace Learning, we, we hope to encourage more companies to, to set up this criteria, to set up a qualification process, set up a selection process, and to see in what ways we can reward uh, for, light, for managers, people managers that are able to coach their team members well. That would be a, a step in the right direction, yeah? So skills and abilities of a workplace coach include quite a lot, quite a, f a lot of different things. So we should be able to identify the objectives of our coaching. Uh, what are the roles played by ourselves and the coach? We should be able to develop a coaching plan, um, adapt our way of coaching to the learner situations. What are some coaching methods? There are quite a number out there. Uh, conduct the coaching well, uh, apply communication techniques, manage challenges, and adapt uh, the learning strategies itself. You know, there are many ways to, to teach. We should suit the methodology to the coachee. Yeah? So ask ourselves if we know the following about our team members. Are they a new intern? Are they more experienced? Do they have prior knowledge? If they have prior knowledge, do we need to teach them differently, coach them differently? What is the basic profile? What is their current KSA? What is their learning style? Do they have a preferred learning style? And what are their motivations? What drives them to learn? Those are important considerations for a coach when we are embarking on coaching. So of course, at the end of it, what we're trying to do is, is help them close a performance gap. There's a present state that they've, they're at and there's a desired state. And that is, um, that is the outcome of the KSA, right? There's the knowledge, there's a skill, there's an attitude. When a performance gap happens, there is some kind of a of a deficiency in a knowledge or a skill or an attitude. So as a coach, are we able to identify that? Can we do a training needs analysis? Can we actually identify it through uh, reviews of work? So there are some ways in which we can do that. We can look at their work performance. We can discuss with them. We can get feedback from uh, their peers, uh, customers, clients. And we can also actually reference SSG skills framework. So when we look at their role, we can actually see what level they're supposed to be at and whether they're performing at that level. And then if there is a gap, if there's a task they're supposed to do that's not meant for their level and we want them to be doing it at that level, what is a training or learning intervention that we can use to close that gap? So those are helpful things we can do, right? So... Of course, we have to know our coachee to understand his or her motivations and, of course, her gap. Understand their role in the specific areas that they do. So know their role, their job role very well. Guide the coachee well through our different uh, methodologies, right, towards meeting the performance standards. And, of course, um, monitor and coach them, yeah? So what are some skills and qualities for an effective coach? Obviously, we want coaches who are effective communicators, who have questioning skills, who can um, listen deeply and actively to the coachee, who are able to provide not just um, feedback, but constructive feedback, you know, things that the coachee can do, right? And uh, very importantly, we, we want coaches to have empathy and be non-judgmental. So that helps the coachee to open up, right? When coaches are empathetic and non-judgmental, people are more likely to be, uh, be more um, sharing about what they feel they can, they, their limitations are and what could enable them to close the gap. What, what are the ways in which they can learn best to close the gap? And of course, rapport building. Yeah? So these are just some skills and qualities of an effective coach, right? No, there are also some methods people can 
uh, learn on their own, right, at the workplace. And a coach can be there to be of support, but certainly these are some ways that people can learn at the workplace by themselves. So maybe um, it's a good time to launch our third and final poll. I'm very curious to see uh, in your own words, right, what are some methods that you have used to learn on your own at the workplace? When learning on your own, what methods do you think has helped you learn most effectively? And just choose the top three. Just think about which one has been something of a favorite that you, you've used to learn. Yeah? Hmm. Okay. Five, four, three. Two, one. I'm going to end the polling. Thank you for playing. And I'm going to share the results, yeah? Okay, so asking questions is one of the great ways. That's a great way because when you ask questions because you already, um, you're announcing what, what is the gap in the knowledge, right? So don't be shy to do that, to learn from others at the workplace. Um, observing others, studying the finished work of others doing own research, receiving feedback, yes. So there are others that are here on the slide that I didn't share, but that's because the polling only allows a certain number. <laughs> so for example, um, accepting challenges is a great way so that you learn about yourself as well. Okay, an uneventful life with no challenge, you'll not grow. So you need to have uh, the courage to actually go for challenges, uh, have some events. Uh, and then learn and audit yourself and see, how did I do? Why did I struggle with that? Oh, I did really well here. It could be that because it's my strength. You know? so, so when you accept challenge, you learn about yourself and you learn about um, what you do best and what you need to work on. Solving problems with others can sometimes be a great way because you can see that um, different people have different ideas and you can learn from them as well. So these are very powerful methods for us to adopt to actually learn at the workplace. However, the presence of a mentor or a guide is, is, is very helpful in these circumstances as well. Yeah? Thank you so much. So, um, yes, we, we have been helping companies. So, for example, workplace learning also means that um, sometimes we have to go down to their workplaces to, to do bite-sized learning, to do some kind of coaching for them. So uh, there, there's this company, Care, and what we did was we went down to the ground and we helped the people managers pick up some coaching skills at the workplace. So there is, I mean, of course, we can actually do uh, some kind of small uh, bite-sized learning at the workplace. That helps a lot as well. Yeah, so, so if you have certain things that require three hours of, of um, training, and instead of sending people for a two-day training, why not create curriculum that a line manager, a supervisor can actually conduct at the workplace uh, and, and have an intentional effort to train your own people? Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> what about mentoring? What is the place of mentoring in workplace learning? Mentoring helps us to enhance capacity. It helps us to develop talent. So this is where um, what we are trying to do with mentoring is we're trying to maximize the potential of of people, uh, their capacity for growth. Okay, so so it is uh, not just looking at a performance gap. It is really looking at like their entire like uh, developmental process moving forward. So we want them to be adaptable, flexible, multitasking, work collaboratively, think critically. So it is uh, beyond just closing a skills gap. It is about helping them to chart their own path and to uh, avail them to networks within the organization that they can go to uh, to learn more about how to grow and develop within the organization, right? Commonly done for talent management. So, so sometimes it's a new staff, a high potential staff, a leader. Uh, it's, but the ways in which mentoring support workplace learning is that it does support learning culture. Okay, because people, when they have mentors, they will learn through their mentors. Yeah. So to set up a formal mentoring program, we, ha we have um, NACE runs training programs to help, uh, how, to help understand how to set up formal mentoring programs. But in general, we need to do needs assessment. We need to have goals for a mentoring program. What is the positioning of the program? Cascading the knowledge about the program 
providing resources, selecting your mentees, and uh, evaluating the program at the end. So you have to have go back to your goals. Did we achieve our goals through this mentoring program? Did people learn, grow, develop, enhance capacity? Um, did we have some succession planning success? So those things matter. Yeah. So features of successful mentoring, we have. Um, you know, meetings that happen regularly. So it can be informal or it can be formal. In training, in our training, we, we discuss the merits of both. Okay, so basically it is a lot, lot more um, focused on the holistic development of a, of a, of a certain individual. So for organizations, it accelerates learning of high-performing employees, improves productivity, uh, technical skills. Sometimes it increases retention rates and employee loyalty. For mentors, actually, um, there is a sense of being needed. Um, they can share um, their uh, the, the wealth of wisdom that they've built up. For the mentor, uh, for the mentees, they will acquire what we call toxic knowledge, knowledge that's not readily available to be read inside the organization, right? It's about um, uh, learning about the organizational ethnographies, you know, what, what has happened, what, what is the culture of the company, what were our great successes, what were our biggest challenges, how did we rise above it, what were the strategies that helped us? So that's where the mentee builds up this toxic knowledge. And, and with this program, there is going to be a sort of learning that you cannot get in the classroom but it's very valuable learning that helps an organization thrive. Yeah? So in an era of disruption and change, we find that it is not the strongest <coughs> and of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that is the most adaptable to change, right? So this is according to Charles Darwin, but it is true today. Because if we don't adapt and we don't change, then we, we may wither away. And we don't want to do that. We want to thrive. So when we look at how best to weather the storm of disruption and change, it is always rooted in the capacity to learn. Capacity to learn at the individual level and at the organizational level. It can be communities, right, which are organizations. So communities that have adapted, and learned, they have thrived. So if we have built muscles to learn, whether proactively or reactively, we can adapt. And if we adapt, we will survive. With survival, we can anticipate the future as we witness this disruption and change. If we survive, then we can take advantage of the new opportunities. And henceforth, we can continue to um, and, you know, innovate, find new pathways, um, and learn to be more successful in a new area or a new growth, er uh, growth and development area. Developing this TNA for workplace learning is then key, all right? And we need to build a culture and an ecosystem for learning. Now, the benefits of implementing workplace learning are such, yeah? We can turn every employee into a learner. If every one of us is invested in learning from the workplace and improving and adapting and being flexible, then it would bode well for us personally as our, as our career progresses. It bodes well for the organization. So it means that we have to have roadmaps, pathways, and resources for reskilling, upskilling, retraining people. <laughs> One, another benefit of workplace learning would be that if it helps to focus uh, us on competency development for not just current and future needs. So there is this activity whereby we need to anticipate like, at the strategy level, what, are we, what do we need to equip our people with? What skills, what competencies? We can build a culture of learning by effective coaching and mentoring from trained managers and supervisors, leading to more effective and faster learning pace at work which we talked about, right? If you are very good at imparting your skill, your wisdom, your knowledge, then your people will be calibrated, leveled up, and hopefully perform at a higher level thereafter. Yeah? Workplace learning through, for example, structured OJT can help us um, improve knowledge management, right? So we can retain uh, the best practices and then some of this text and knowledge can be captured as well in some ways, yeah? And hopefully with, with this culture of learning, 
growth and development, a focus on developing people holistically, helping them to close skills gap, we can increase employee engagement and performance. And um, in fact, it can drive not just individual performance, but of course, organizational performance. So we feel that workplace learning can are the building blocks to help us learn, adapt, survive, and thrive in an area of disruption and change. Yeah. So what we have done at the National Center of Excellence for Workplace Learning is we are now putting together the National Workplace Learning Framework. We were uh, in the midst of launching it this year, but because of COVID, it will be launched early next year sometime and we'll invite everyone, we'll share the news and we hope that um, you'll be part of the journey of discovering uh, more about the Workplace Learning Framework. But I have shared with you earlier some of the component parts of what we'll be looking for when we are trying to create a holistic uh, uh, drive for workplace learning for organizations. Yeah. So NACE, what we provide is capability building through NACE programs. Here I have um, provided a website address. Of course, um, you can go to our website and you can see next year's calendar set up as well. This is up till the end of the year, but certainly we are in very busy uh, running training programs, equipping industry to build up skills in workplace learning. Though we say that classroom learning isn't the goal, but the thing is we need to build up the skills for uh, blueprint, blueprint development, for coaching, for mentoring, so that when you go back to the workplace, you develop the OJT blueprints, you have the skills through coaching to then uh, teach your people, train and coach your people well using the blueprints. You can mentor them. Of course, if, you, if we were to equip you with training needs analysis, skills gap analysis, you'd be able to do that as well within your organizations. We also provide consulting services for companies that want to implement workplace learning. Uh, for example, developing uh, blueprints for your key, key core areas of work. We can do that. We can actually come in and help with skills gap analysis. And uh, we do provide whole consulting for a variety of, of areas as well. So please co connect with us if you are interested in our training programs, if you're interested for your company to implement some workplace learning uh, strategies, we'd be very, very happy to come in and assist. That's our job. So we'd be very happy for you to connect with us on these friends. <laughs> so we, to date, we've assisted about 120 companies across various multiple sectors in, in various areas. And I wanted to actually uh, leave you with our contacts as well as um, uh, some uh, maybe uh, some some time for q and I know it's four o'clock but if there are questions we we would be happy I'd be happy to stay and, and address them yeah so thank you so much for for sh sharing during the polls and the activities and for hearing us out on the a ways in which workplace learning can help us manage change and disruption. Thank you so much. So here I have an evaluation as well for uh, the session. So if you could be so kind as to uh, scan through and actually uh, scan the QR code and give us your evaluation, that would be terrific. Thank you. I hope that uh, you can contact us certainly if you, you know, there is some, some of these aspects that you're very keen to learn more about. We'd be pleased to connect back. Hi, I'm looking at the questions. Um, let me see. There's a question about the grant, the Workplace Learning uh, Excellence Grant, who is it eligible for? It's not just for SMEs. So there are certain uh, criteria. So once uh, you contact with us, we'll be able to share with you. So it is really about um, helping. Uh, we have helped uh, international companies as well, but there are certain uh, conditions to do with uh, the Singaporean workforce. And, I mean, or rather, the re it has to be uh, for uh, the resident workforce because of course we are supporting our industries in Singapore 
they can be foreign and they can be a foreign company, but they employ Singaporeans. So we do provide uh, grants for companies that uh, serve the Singapore marketplace. Let's put it this way. Thank you for that question. But I would encourage uh, you to contact us, then we can pretty much uh, see the eligibility and advise accordingly. Okay, I see a question from uh, Sekar. What role do you see for digital technology in workplace learning? So this is uh, an interesting question in the sense that uh, we now see that um, we are in a Zoom session. So uh, this has been uh, happening since May, right? And people have adapted to learn uh, using this form of digital technology. So I certainly see a very strong and powerful role that um, digital technology can play. E-learning has been with us for a long time, but I mean, um, the uptake of e-learning has prior to COVID was e-learning as in an e-learning program where you just click and you, you know, that kind of thing um, was not that I don't think it resonated with a lot of people because I think learning is also a social activity. We like to have interactions. We like to have feedback. We like to work in groups. We like to make visible our thinking with e-learning. Sometimes, um, because um, it is, uh, it is there is no human interaction, right? At the other end, it's more of a reflective piece that we do. There is learning, but it it doesn't allow for that peer sharing. So it hasn't prior to COVID, it wasn't that uh, taken up well. But now I find that more and more people are resorting to myself included. I've been to Udemy and you know to learn new skills. So certainly, I think that digital learning management systems and digital learning itself. Um, digital platforms rather for learning uh, will be more powerful moving forward. <laughs> How has workplace learning shifted with COVID and more virtual workplaces being the predominant working mode? So in our training delivery for mentoring and for coaching, we have talked about uh, how can we, can we coach people virtually? You know, is it possible? So of course it's possible. The medium is technology, right? But the human factor of guiding, constructive feedback, um, sharing about the certain, certain types of skills, it can be done. We can share screen, we can show our work, we can coach. However, I would say that uh, things that need a lab, <laughs> things that need um, psychomotor skills, right? Um, it might be more challenging. Right? For example, I tried to learn uh, how to make a dish. Right? My friend was teaching me through Zoom. But one thing that she couldn't do is taste my food. So obviously, she can show me every step and I can watch it. But um, I don't know if my work product met the criteria or the standard required. So for assessment, it might be harder for certain types of competencies. I hope that answers your question. Do you see major changes in classroom learning and the new normal? If so, what are the key trends? Um, we are awaiting to see because right now um, the uptake of classroom training has not been uh, has not been been strong. People are still concerned. Um, also, uh, social distancing is a an issue, right? Because we need to have a one meter rule. So I think I I, I suspect that. Until we are clear of this COVID-19, until the vaccine comes and all that, we will, we will go back to the classroom, but it will be uh, probably smaller classes and our activities, learning activities, will have to be altered. So there is uh, a lot of activities in the past. I, I, was, I came from uh, experiential learning, a lot of um, touching feeling of, of, of props, you know, when we do training activities. So now we have to rethink because we can't have people... Uh, freely touching things. Um, I mean, there are safety issues to being quite close, you know. So stuff like that will matter and will impact whether people will want to, will find enjoyment in being in classroom training and will want to go for more and more of it. 
So I think there are not many more questions, uh, unless I'm opening up the Q&A. Yes, I don't see any more questions. But you know, um, my contact is around. I'd like to switch back. Yes. So I'd love to hear from any of you. Um, if I did not answer your question, please do write me. Um, I've also included my two colleagues' emails here if you have an interest in our training and consulting programs. Um, thank you so very much for listening. And I think, um, Azra, are you still there? <laughs> Hi. Yes, Hi. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining this session. I hope it was helpful. And thank you, Aziza. Um, thank you to Skills Future as well for this collaboration. Mm, um, thank you. Yeah. So if you want to contact Aziza herself, you can do so. Uh, if you want to contact us, you can email us at hello at l three dot work. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you at the next one. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful Tuesday.